think that it's generally accepted that diabetic neuropathy is amongst the commonest of all the late complications of diabetes. Wherever there's diabetes, you're going to see neuropathy. Uh, Europe is no exception. It's a, uh, it's a problem in every country. Uh, it often goes unrecognized, undiagnosed, undiagnosed until much later in the natural history when if there is adequate screening, it should be picked up early. This came from work in leprosy, and leprosy, an infectious disease not dissimilar to tuberculosis, damages peripheral nerves and you end up with the insensitive hand and foot. And the foot is very similar to that seen in advanced neuropathy. And it was Dr. Paul Brand, who was a pioneer in treating leprosy uh, in South India, a, a surgeon actually, who described pain as God's greatest gift to mankind. And it's the loss of this gift, the loss of pain, then you realize what a gift it is, because these are the patients that come back with recurrent foot ulceration, foot problems. Certainly prevention is always preferable to treatment, and again, treatment of uh, early neuropathy is preferable to leaving it until you've got the very late complications. So this is certainly true. Diabetic neuropathy is expensive, not only the foot ulcer. And years ago, a, a study from America suggested that one foot ulcer episode as an outpatient was tens of thousands of dollars not being admitted to hospital. It's much more than that today. But we mustn't forget that painful neuropathy also has fiscal consequences because uh, patients with painful neuropathy don't sleep at night, they become depressed and anxious, that they're missing work. It's often they're the breadwinner, as we say in English, the person earning the money for the family. Uh, and then they are off work, so they depend on social support. So these are all uh, economic consequences, both the foot ulcer, which is extremely expensive, amputation, which is a disaster for the patient and the uh, economy, uh, and painful neuropathy. So all forms of neuropathy lead to fiscal consequences. <laughs> Studies from both my country, the UK, and from Netherlands suggest that at any one time, probably 2% of the diabetic population have an active foot ulcer. And the natural history of a foot ulcer is it may heal up with expensive treatment, but again, recurrence up to 50% a year. So this is a huge economic consequence. In some countries, in the Middle East, where we have an epidemic of type 2 diabetes, Type 2 diabetes, I was recently in the Middle East, in Doha and Abu Dhabi. Probably one in three has diabetes. We see much more foot problems there, from barefoot walking and hot sand and walking with inappropriate footwear or no footwear. Here and in my country, you're more likely to see cold injury at the moment with snow outside. So the um, patient isn't aware that the foot is too cold or too hot, and this can lead to thermal or uh, hypothermic cold injury. <laughs> Sadly, it's got worse. Uh, it was recently calculated by the International Working Group on the diabetic foot. It's probably every 20 seconds. This may be that we're getting better at diagnosing diabetes early and patients are coming in, have an amputation, they're found to have diabetes, so that counts as an amputation in diabetes. But the message is clear. An ounce of prevention is what's needed. And an ounce is an old-fashioned English, like a gram or several grams, an ounce of prevention is what is needed uh, to save so much money. I think it's education not only of patients but also of healthcare professionals. For example, many doctors will ask the patient, how are your feet? And they'll say, oh, thank you very much for asking, they're fine. Never fail to examine the feet of your patient with diabetes. I had one patient come in, I said, how are your feet? I said, oh, thank you very much. They're fine, thank you for asking. I said, I'd like to look at them. And he tried to take his shoe off. One of them was nailed to his foot, and he couldn't feel that. So never rely on a history. You have to examine the feet. Paul Brand was asked at the American College 
years ago, what's the most important thing we as doctors can do to reduce amputations and diabetes? And being in America, they're expecting some expensive new test or x-ray or scan. He said the most important thing to do, you can do, to reduce amputation and diabetes, every time you see someone with diabetes, remove the shoes and socks and look at the feet. So it's simple preventative medicine. If we, as physicians, fail to examine the feet of our patients with diabetes, and we see them perhaps once every three months, can we honestly expect them to do it every day? We have to set the example. So it's not only patients that need education, but primary care, nurses. Everybody needs to know that the loss of pain leads to all sorts of potential problems in the foot, most of which are entirely preventable. The foot exam, uh, as we defined for the American Diabetes Association some uh, seven years ago, in fact this month, I remember it was cold in Chicago, uh, and um, the key thing, again, is clinical observation. No expensive equipment. A pin, a filament, a tuning fork. Most importantly, your eyes look at the feet. Feel the pulses. Are the shoes appropriate? Very simple stuff, nothing expensive. No equipment needing any electrical power sources needed. Simple tools that we all have, whether in primary care, in the Sahara Desert, in Manhattan, or in Cluj. I think it's extremely important and only northern European countries such as ours, Ireland, Scandinavia, the Benelux countries, Australia, New Zealand, United States and Canada that I've given you there most of the countries in the world that have good podiatry. So podiatry is exceedingly important uh, in the management of the diabetic foot. Podiatrists are specialists below the knee, especially in the foot, uh, and we have excellent podiatrists. They're part of the team. We believe in the team approach. Podiatrists are a seminal importance in that team because they're trained in inspection, in treatment of local foot problems, in debridement, and they can do, some of them can do small surgical procedures as well. So they're a key member working with other members of the team. The least important member of the team is probably me as a diabetes specialist. The most important is the patient, the podiatrist, the nurse, and the shoe fitter. That's absolutely essential, I think. And, and for example, we've helped, uh, and, and Anne Knowles uh, and other members of my team, in South America, where we've helped in the Save the Diabetic Foot in Brazil program. And there, a lot of uh, specialist nurses have learned local techniques that podiatrists do in other countries that they can do a bit of debridement, a bit of looking after the toenails, callus, trimming. So if there isn't podiatry, my view is that you should invest in perhaps why not have podiatry? Why not be the leaders in Romania to bring podiatry in? But in the meantime, the nurses can do a lot of the very simple tasks with training, uh, and I think that's possible as an interim measurement, not as a long-term answer. You know, we're all in the team, uh, and we've had today, of course, uh, a lot of discussion between neurologists and diabetologists. Uh, I guess I'm a bit of both, because I did some training in neurology as well as diabetes. Um, and we need to know, we shouldn't be arguing and squabbling over cases. As my friend Larry Harkless said in the, in the United States, where people, orthopedic surgeons, are fighting with podiatrists, because they think they're going to take away their private practice. The answer to them is there is enough feet to go around everybody. And that's the answer to your question. We should work together as a team. And if the neurologist is particularly apt at looking after this particular neuropathic problem, that's fine. If the diabetologist is, that's fine. We should know when to ask for help from the other member of the team. We encourage, at the ASD, we go out of our way to encourage young people to join not only clinicians but scientists. The future is in training and bringing up people to replace the oldies like me. 
So we need to train people. So we offer, for example, membership for under 35s is virtually nothing, just a few euros. We offer huge discounts for attending our meeting. We give travel grants and statement grants to come to our meeting this year in Stockholm. Uh, and, and we welcome with open arms young people and we try and encourage them to become involved in research. And we have what we've introduced in the last 10 years is a symposium called the Rising Stars, where people under a certain age submit their research. If they are awarded the prize, they get 30,000 euros towards their research as a grant, plus they give a prize lecture at our annual meeting with everything, all costs covered. So we really want to encourage people to come into diabetes Diabetes, if you know diabetes, you know the whole of medicine. Every area of medicine is covered somehow by diabetes. The eyes, ophthalmology, the kidneys, nephropathy, autonomic neuropathy, the bowel, gastroenterology, neurology. We've heard it all today. Cardiology, obviously, heart, neurology, everything. <laughs>